That's what I wanted out of it, right? Was the ability to be like, oh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. How about this? How about this? Uh, yeah, that's good. That's kind of the level of feedback that I wanted from the system. Uh, this week, <clears throat> I thought we'd spend a little more time working on Remember Apollo. I have some really, I think some really fun plans for what I want to do. Plans I have for a game that's based on Remember Apollo that'll be using the same sort of mechanics. And so this week, what I wanted to do was spend some time developing out some systems that'll help me make that game faster, basically, uh, that are based on the game that I made for Ludendare. Uh, this is the first tool on my list of things that I wanted to develop. If you're on my Discord, you would have got a sneak peek at this uh, already. Um, what it is, is it projects out, right, toward whichever node I want, a series of trajectories, all possible trajectories, interpolated by speed. So you can see here this little red bit is how likely we are to hit the mark. And if, if I bring the node towards us, you can see the likelihood of hitting it becomes way, way, way higher. Were there any critiques that were really helpful or insightful? You do get specific users that give you helpful feedback, but the, the real feedback comes from the aggregate feedback. Like for example, a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people, and a distinct subset of people seemed to struggle with the idea of coming back. And because uh, the game sort of like you go out and then you come back basically through the parts you've been already. And I did put, I considered that that might be confusing and I put in some extra deer that jump in the direction that they want the game wants you to go in. There's like breadcrumbs leading you back. But two things, I think maybe one, one thing that I think might be an issue is that in the web version of the game, it's less clear where an exit is because of this black border. On full screen desktop, this runs right up to the edge of the screen and there's no black border. So I think some players might not know where the exits and entries are based on the, playing it in the browser. So they might not realize if a door has opened up to me, it's pretty clear, but I can understand if it's not super clear to everybody. The other thing that they might not have done is noticed that the, the deer jump in a direction that leads you forward, right? If you follow the, the way the deer are moving, if you're not paying attention to the story, then you won't know that the deer are jumping in that direction because he's a hunter, he's chasing the deer. Like, do you think when it collides here, it collides and then collides again because we're projecting from that point. Do you think that might be the case? Maybe we ignore the first one. Maybe if I disable the collision check on the first one, then we should be able to then do a test from this point without worrying about colliding with anything. Hey. Uh, interesting though that we get this very, very stifled bounce. I wonder what that's from. Oh, something's wrong here. Hang on a second. This line here should follow that blue line. That's the problem. This, this gray line here. So this is recursive. This then calls itself, has a position, has a velocity, and some iterations. We determine the trajectory points based on our position and our velocity. Why does running this through the second time give me a bad number? I mean, that looks right. I think we got it. So it's, it's divided by step. Ah, oh, we got it. First, first try, first try. <laughs> yes, yeah, first try guys. There we go. Look, look at that. So you can see what we're doing is 360 degrees and each of them has one, two, three, four, five slices. And that gives us sort of like a big disco ball of potential. Then what we want to do is only draw the ones that actually terminate. 
So that's that's the end result of all of this. There we go. So we do see some bounces showing up now. This is so expensive, this system. Let's see what the damage is on the processor. It's hard. This might be something that we need to resolve over like multiple seconds. Like maybe in the long term, this is something that we actually press a button and then we wait a couple frames and it does all of the checks. Like tens of thousands of checks to figure it out. Because it doesn't have to happen every frame. Right now it's happening every frame. So you can see here, these are the points where it's actually testing. So there are still some areas, even if you crank it up to 500, there are still some areas where it's not going to figure it out no matter what you do, unless you get really close. I think that everything sweep is the right way to do it. And I think doing it over a number of seconds is the right way to do it. And then saving that somewhere. As a developer, what I want in the long term, it would be really cool to create a procedural set of levels. To just go click, create levels, please. Um, but I think that's a little far off into the future. Last night, I worked on that a little bit more and got pretty far along with it. Uh, I'm at a point now where I'm about to take all that processing that was happening every frame and to spread it out over multiple frames so that in the long run what we can do is have like uh, five or six frames where it bakes the predictions and then maps them. I can't, I'm so bad at understanding the language of math. I understand the dynamics. It's hard for me to, I look at math language and I haze over. I was shocking at math in high school. <sighs> Yay, it works. This is awkward when we click this and move it, but this was working just fine. Oh, I see, because when we click it, it becomes the one that we're clicking towards. Sure, that makes perfect sense. Chipsel's awesome. I only just realized Chipsel was a curl. Oh, look at that. Did you see that? It just, it just did it. Yeah, she's so talented. Whoa. Look at that. Whoa! That's testing all of that and it's going to show us all of the built pods. Like look at these ones. These ones here are the wall bounces. You can see the, the differences. So like these are all the normal arcs. This is off the wall and then this is, uh, this is off the roof and then this is off the wall. So like if I just go to here how good's that? Whoa! That was sick. That was really good. I really like that. Seven. Seven is such a king. Definitely some overlap, but that's okay. I mean, it's just, I can make the radi radii smaller. Wait, did it go over it again? No, it's quite separate. Look at that. Look at the distance between them. It's really even. Nice. That's what seven is on its own. Pretty good, man. The question is, how do we reduce this such that we don't draw any of these in the middle? We just draw the first one, the last one, and a line that goes between them. Whoa. <laughs> For every key value pair of a list of colliders and list of lists of vector twos, <laughs> uh, do this, please. Oh, hang on a second. It is a list of, that is correct, actually. For every list of vector two in my list of list of vector twos, it was actually correct. I'm just confused myself, that's all. Okay, huh, huh, the computer wasn't wrong. So weird, <laughs> soon. We don't have to let it render all the way, but I want it to start rendering a little faster. Yes, 
Please, 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 please. Look at that! Look at that! Wow! Can we draw that and draw the things just in case? So we can place our things anywhere inside of there and we know it'll work. Yes, totally! Look at that! I wonder why these don't seem... they don't seem quite right. Like, that's right. Some of these are really correct. Really obviously correct. Others, not so much. Today we're going to be doing our first attempts at some procedural generation for Remember Apollo. I am very happy with where the trajectory mapping is going. I think we're at a point now where I have uh, trajectories being mapped in real time, very, very fast. I have them mapped by Collider. So which set of colliders they bounce off. So I have separate solutions mapped um, per point, per, to, per two points. Uh, and I have those solutions mapped to a value that I can call difficulty. So I can say, okay, this is this hard or this is this hard. And we can then use that to drive a procedural generation algorithm that will then modulate level designs to make those jumps easier and harder. That's the goal. What you're looking at here is this circle represents everywhere that you can pull over the character, right? So you click, drag, and release, right? These uh, polygons represent uh, the area within which the solution, a solution exists, right? So we can drag to here, or here, or here and that will give us an answer between the corresponding lines here, so these two green ones here. Everywhere between here and here represents from up here to down here, which then results in a successful shot. The different colors represent different kinds of strategies, right? Bouncing off of different colliders. So I can drag this around in real time and get some pretty quick results. We can see here, this red one here has a rating of 23. The rating goes up to 100, it's like a percentage. And um, so basically you're 23% likely if you drag down here to bounce off this wall and get it in. Um, as in, a human could figure it out if they looked at this wall and tried to get it, they'd probably get it one fifth of the time. I, I, that's just the difficulty rating. It's not really, it's an abstract thing that I put together uh, with arbitrary numbers, but it's there to express difficulty. Um, that expression of difficulty is right now based on just the average length of the trajectories, but they can be, I could see it being, I had a different rating that was based on the area of the um, hull, which is a separate thing, but yeah. Uh, it's coming along pretty well. It's, it's very quick. I can use it at editor time to place things myself. That's what I wanted out of it, right? Was the ability to be like, oh, yeah, that doesn't make sense. How about this? How about this? Uh, yeah, that's good. That's kind of the level of feedback that I wanted from the system, from the tool. And I think now we're at a point where we could probably, we could use this quickly to make levels, right? Like that's a 58. Okay, what about if I make it uh it makes it more difficult. Sixty-nine. Mm, okay, you know you can figure it out that way. You got some really crazy results up here when we talk about bouncing off of multiple surfaces. Um, we could we could add all these up and get like a value that was like the total difficulty of the of the thing. Um, it's pretty quick at finding some of the more uh, some of the more difficult ones. Um, so a couple of different solutions here. You can see suddenly this goes from like, uh, you know, very difficult to very easy just between there and there. 
And this is actually impossible. So you, I guess, technically couldn't do that, but you could do that. Maybe we bring this up a little bit. Let me bring this down slightly to increase the angle. So what I'm going to do at some point, maybe not today, is uh, I have a tool that that checks the range of the solution angles. So see how these two, if you think about like a clock, the angle between this point and this point is like 40 degrees or something. I have a version of this score that actually maps based on the angle. So this solution would be considered easier than this solution because of the angle of uh, basically the range of accepted angles. I think long term it, it probably should be angles from here out, initial angles, which is basically the angle from this hull to this hull or somewhere around there. To be a great UI UX designer, do you have to be a good artist? Not at all. No. You just have to understand the principles of visual communication. A good artist has a lot of technical skill, right, in recreating images. A UX or UI designer doesn't need to do that. It's more about understanding visual communication. Things like contrast, what colors mean, clarity, those things, right? Understanding how people interpret images. That's for the UI part. For the UX part, you don't even need that. For the UX part, it's more about uh, still things like proximity, but for the most part, it's it's about understanding how the mind digests information in its structure rather than just its visual presentation. So information architecture for like a website, that's UX. The labeling of buttons or sections or pages, uh, that's UX. Uh, the actual inputs, so do you have a checkbox or a radio button? Is it a slider or is it a dial? Those things, that's UX as well. You don't need to be a good artist to do, to do those things. This is like, this, this feels like I have like the Rosetta Stone and I'm trying to like <laughs> understand what languages mean. I'm like, I'm like, I. Th I, th I think the ancient J-Box scribes, I think they meant this. I have no idea what any of this means. I'm sort of like, it feels like I'm just copying something that I don't understand. That's what it feels like. That's because that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is. What's the state of ProGen? Have I decided to do it? I'm considering it, but I need to make this work first. Well, I don't need to make it work first. I just happen to be thinking about this right now, but it's on the cards. I'm going to leave this for now. I don't care anymore. So you got two options. We go into procedural generation or I start thinking about art for the new... I've already been thinking about art. Check it out. What do you think of this for Apollo? He kind of looks like a Final Fantasy character, but I like that. I would animate him a lot. He'd be super flowy. So Procgen, Procgen looks like this, right? You, you have a series of things right variables and you think of those variables as sliders right and you have basically the sliders you can think of as dimensions in a space and we can describe in this game space that we've created we can describe what we think are easy jumps, hard jumps, interesting jumps, right? We can make, we can describe this space. So it's parametric. It means that there are multiple factors that are involved and the space is defined as each level, right? So each of these squares is going to be one unit, one, one thing that can be designed and the thing has parameters. I've already got some parameters in my levels. I've got the walls, top, bottom, left, right. I've got colliders. So I could create something where there are exactly two colliders per level and they can be modulated, the size of them, 
the position of them, right? Size of collider, position of colliders. Those are all sliders that we can change in our multi-dimensional parametric space, right? And somewhere in this space, right? These dimensions relate to these sliders, right? Somewhere in this space is a really nice level or a series of really nice levels, right? And the goal of procedural generation is to encode a series of rules that help the computer toggle these sliders to find the interesting space. You just need some way of defining what's good or interesting or some logic about how you're going to navigate the space and then set the computer to work changing the sliders in order to find the space or just spitting out variations, right? I'm modeling the game after Jump King, right? What I like about it, one of the things I really like happens to be the interesting and unique puzzles and art artworks that you pass through as you're trying to beat the game, right? So this level, right? This could have been procedurally generated. I don't think it was, but it fe feasibly, you know, you got three big colliders, you know that you can jump up them. A computer could figure this out, right? A computer could, could generate this. But the game itself is designed very, very linearly. You're basically having like a conversation with the developers, right? The developers are like, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And you're going, I think so. I guess, no, yes. And sharing those dynamics, the frustrations you have. Oh, I hate that part of the game, right? Those are parts of, those are important factors to, that contribute to its success, right? A lot of Jump King's success comes down to the fact that it's a gauntlet that is the same for everyone and is creatively designed in such a way that it's you can blame the developers. You know that they did it on purpose, right? A certain thing. If I was to procedurally generate this game to be like Jump King, I would need to somehow capture whatever that is and describe it in the algorithm that generates the levels. And my concern straight off the bat is that that might be really difficult to do. The solution space that is described by the algorithm will be too samey or nonsensical. Yeah, I'm concerned that it would be too obviously procedurally generated. Interesting thing about Jump King is it's, it's a little more constrained than this. You can't really pick whichever angle you want. And when you hit a wall, a very specific thing happens. I don't think it needs to be like that. Like getting over it with Bennett Foddy is not as constrained as Jump King. And that game was super popular when it came out in the same way. I must be tired. We should wrap it up. I'm gonna import this and then I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm confused. They're an extra package, really? I think I understand how this works, right? I place that, that's the center tile, and then every variation I add. So I do this, 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 and that becomes... Wait a second. Wait, I've done this totally wrong. I totally, yeah, 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 I just figured that out. So now that I've got this rule tile, how do I, how do I make it do it? use the rule tile in the tile palette? Can I literally drag it in? <laughs> what? Look at that. It actually worked. Totally worked. Hey pal, thanks for watching. And thanks most especially to the patrons and Twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project Insignia. To find out more, click the links in the description below. And uh, if you like this video, tell YouTube by clicking the like button and then YouTube will tell me and then I'll make more videos. That's nice.